All right, continuing with unit three, our introduction to vector shapes, and working on exercise two, making our own custom emoji using uh, vector shapes within Photoshop. So we started with Emoji Maker, and we came up with our own icon that gets us close to what we want. I'm inspired by my favorite cartoon. So if I open up what I got for exercise two, you see my folder is nicely organized. The ones that have been completed, I've marked green. Exercise two is the one I'm working on. It's marked yellow. I have a screen grab, which is right here. It's called screenshot. And it's a PNG file. And we learned how PNGs can support transparency here. It doesn't need to. And then I did the one that you get from export and downloading the PNG. And I just wanted to show you, when you do that, it is an, a transparent file, which is nice, but it's much smaller in terms of resolution. So if we make it match the one that we got the screen grab, you'll see how the pixel resolution is, is not as strong, right? And that's the problem with raster images. Now, if I open the other thing we exported, if you want to, we downloaded what's called an SVG, which stands for Scalable Vector Graphic. It's one of the, the most basic forms of vector format. But the problem with it is, if we open that up, and I don't know if I encourage you to do this because it can take a while for Illustrator to open for you, <clears throat> but it will open in a vector program like so, and then you can actually see what's different between a pixel-based image and a vector image. So it has layers like we're used to, but layers here are an organizational tool. Because every time you make a new vector shape, and we're going to see this in Photoshop, it's going to automatically output its own path for it. So I can turn them on and off just like layers. You can see it's a lot like our compositing skills. Let's get to our, our basic background shape, which is on the bottom here. Now what this looks like when you select it is a collection of anchor points and then a path designated by a blue line in this case that goes between the anchor points. That is all a vector is. In fact, a vector can be empty and not look like anything except that it has the anchor points and it has the paths in between the anchor points. And that's mathematically plotted by the computer so that it's always perfectly smooth. This is the way you get smooth curves. They're not generated by, by square pixels. And then you can have two attributes for any vector. You can have what's called a fill, which is like cutting it out of colored paper. And you can also have what's called a stroke, which you can think of as an outline. So if I choose dark blue, for instance, now I've got both. And you can turn them on or off. So I can turn the fill off with that kind of red line that means no fill and leave the stroke on. Or I could turn the stroke off, no stroke, and turn the fill on whatever color I want, but I have to select it first. So these are all properties of that vector shape. And those vectors can be transformed just like we're used to, that we did with our exercise one. They can be warped, they can be flipped, they can be distorted in slightly different ways, but in similar ways to what we were doing in, in Photoshop. So this is the better format because this can be outputted to any size, but it's a lot more of a burden to kind of work with when we're not familiar with an Illustrator program or a vector-based program. So what we're going to do is make our own emoji based on this using vector tools within Photoshop. Photoshop has vector tools. It just cannot save things as vectors, which is an interesting distinction. And I'm not actually all that clear on the reasons why not. I think because they bought 
an illustrator from Macromedia a while ago, and they want to keep it valid. Right? And Illustrator has a lot of functions that Photoshop doesn't for vectors. But for our purposes of just making a basic emoji, which is like a cutout of flat paper, we can use Photoshop to do it. And as long as we don't rasterize our layers, it will have all the advantages of vector shapes, which means it's infinitely scalable. So from that same Photoshop file, from that same PSD file, we could size it to 60 inches by 60 inches, and it would be perfectly clean. We could size it to 6 inches by 6 inches. It would be perfectly clean, all from the same file. Because we'll use vector shapes that we never lock into pixels. But that takes a, a different kind of discipline than what we were doing with compositing. So we'll get to that. So let me close those. So it's nice to have a, a larger raster file to build on. So that's why I'm going to use the screenshot. And I'm going to open up that screenshot I took. And I'm going to open it in Photoshop. All right. And now, because it's just a screen grab, no matter how large I was able to make it on my screen, I need to check its size. And I need to make it print resolution. So for our purposes, this is going to be at least 8 inches by 10 inches. right? So I look. And most emojis are designed within a square. So I look at the height here. I want to make that. I want to see what the limiting factor is. So I'm going to make that the lowest number here at least 8. And then the resolution I'm going to up to 350, our lab resolution. Now as long as your project is at least 8 by 10 as a full layout, at at least 300 you're meeting the minimum requirements. I always go a little bit higher with 350 so we can print it a little bit larger if we want to. You'll notice what that does is it will start to, it's making up a lot of pixels. So it's going to give us a little bit of a, a distortion effect at the edges. See those kind of, the little glows that happen. But generally, you can see the softening. And you see how the computer will enhance the contrast at the edge. So you get this, what's called a simultaneous contrast effect, where it gets a little bit lighter. <laughs> on the sides of dark shapes and a little bit darker on the sides of light shapes. This is what sharpening does as well. Okay, now I'm going to go to canvas size. So we did image size, now we're going to do canvas size. And I'm going to take whatever that width is, and as long as it's at least 8 by 10, and I'm going to extend the height to 10 inches. And I'm going to grow it from the center. And when I do that, it actually builds space above and below it. So image size changes your pixel grid. Canvas size extends your pixel grid. You can also use canvas size to crop, but it's not the best tool for cropping. To shrink your, your pixel size. So now, I'm going to go to image size one more time and just see what I have. I have something that's a little bit more than 8 inches wide, just because that's what my PNG was and 10 inches tall at 350 pixels per inch. This gives me a file that's about 28 megabytes right now with just the one layer. That looks good. Now what it shows in the bottom left-hand corner of Photoshop is what I'm actually seeing right now. And what I'm seeing is my actual pixels at only 16%. <laughs> so I'm looking at it at 72 pixels per inch right now. If I zoom in, I can see it at 100%. And this is what the pixels would actually print as. So see how they're jagged as anything, right? It's like it was, was torn out rather than cut cleanly out of construction paper. So we're going to replace those shapes with our own. And this is how we're going to do it. We are going to make our first vector shape. And vector tools are not all that common in Photoshop. So that's why they're at the bottom of the tool set. You'll find them underneath what's called a path selection tool. And you'll see that that looks a lot like what I was showing you in Illustrator. So the path selection is a way to select vectors. We're going to ignore that completely. Go right to the tool underneath it. And then hold, it, hold down your button until it opens the drawer. And then we're going to pick the most basic big shape we can to get started with. 
Now, I also have inspiration for this project, and that inspiration is the Johnny Quest little Boston Terrier bulldog thing. And that's what I'm making an emoji of. So this is where I start with the limited tools, but I can change those shapes based on what I need. So I'm going to start with just what's called the ellipse tool. It gives me circles and ovals. And I just click and drag. Notice I didn't make any new layer. And I'm not even going to try to make it a perfect circle. If I wanted to, I'd hold down shift. And that would limit it to only a perfect circle. But I'm just roughly placing it. What you can see is that blue path outline for this vector shape. And then it will fill it in with black, just the default color. And at any time, we can click on it and we can see what its properties are up here in the shape options. So right now it has a stroke and it has a fill. The stroke is one pixel wide. I'm going to turn that stroke off by clicking on stroke and saying no stroke, that red line that goes through it. That means every shape I do from now on won't have a stroke. And I don't want us to deal with strokes right now. The fill, I can choose one of the frequently used colors. I can use the color selector here. And I can give it this kind of gray color. My favorite way to do this is to actually right click double click rather, double left click on the thumbnail of your vector shape and it will immediately open up the color selector. Whenever you see a color selector in Photoshop, it also means you can drag your cursor without having to change anything onto a Photoshop document and you can steal colors directly from it. And this is one of the reasons we use the Emoji Maker, which uses web colors. So I'll steal that kind of gray color, that gray background color, which is better to use than white for emojis because you need them to show up on white. And I can always change that later. So I've changed the property of that ellipse. So it has no stroke and it has that fill color. Now what I can do is make another one. So I stay on the shape tool and I'm going to make another ellipse. And instead of making it pointy, like my ghost shape, I'm going to make it match the mandible of my intended bulldog Boston Terrier thing, like this. Now, as soon as I do that, notice it makes a separate shape layer. There are ways to combine vector shapes into the same layer. There's no reason to. They take up the same memory either way, and this way, it allows me to select their color individually. So if I wanted to make this one maybe just a slight bit lighter than the other one, I could. Okay, very quickly you're going to see the problem with building big shapes on top of our screen grab. It's like we can't see it anymore. So now we're going to do a technique called onion skinning. We're going to go to our background layer, which is here. We're going to duplicate it with Command J. And then we're going to take its opacity down as a layer to around 50% or less. I think I could probably get away with around 30%. And then I'm going to move that up to the very top so that it's like a piece of tracing paper as a template for the shapes I build. And then I'm going to click on the padlock so that I can't accidentally select this layer so it doesn't get in my way as I'm building underneath it. Okay, so I'm not seeing a whole lot of contrast yet, right? Everything's very faint. So let's do that big black shape that's behind the eyes. And all I need to do is use a shape tool. Now I can use a regular ellipse tool. Place it here, and then you see the transform box. I can use my arrow keys and move it. I can use the edges and move it, get it to the shape I want. And the reason we do exercise one before exercise two is because you know that you can rotate it should you want to. You can right click within it. And you can't, um, you can't do like the warping in the same way exactly. But once we plot it, 